Welcome into this Monday edition of Talking Ball. My name is Jerry Hamilton, joined by CJ Vogel. Uh, today, CJ, we're going to talk about Sark's freshman class. We're 20, less than 24 hours before 17 early enrollees hit the field officially as Texas Longhorns for the first time. And we can't wait to kind of break that down by position for the Texas fans. Who are the player 17 early enrollees? Kind of what of our expectations for these guys? Uh, where do they kind of sit on the depth chart headed into spring uh, practice? But before we do that, I want to take a second for the sponsor of Talking Ball, and that is John Donovan, president of Longhorn Wealth Management Group. John is a proud Texas X's life member, and his wife and all six of John's siblings are also University of Texas graduates. John has also served 15 years as a Texas X's board member and is a certified financial planner who has spent over 30 years providing investment, retirement, insurance, and estate planning services and solutions to all his clients. So it is John's long history with, with and love of UT that explains why he has dedicated his firm to providing total wealth management for Texas alumni, employee, family, and friends. Longhorn Wealth wants to wish the best of luck to both our men's and women's basketball teams as they prepare to enter their prospective NCAA tournaments this week, and we both we hope they both advance as far as possible in those brackets. Speaking of advancing, Longhorn Wealth wants to offer a free 90-minute consultation to all on the on Texas football family and friends to help advise advance their own financial future success. So please call John Donovan and his Longhorn Wealth team at 972 972- 707-4900 or visit longhornwealth.net for your free 90-minute consultation on how to explore how they can help you achieve true financial independence. Thank you, John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group. All right, CJ, let's just, we're going to go by positions, okay? So Texas fans, this is what we're going to do. We're going to start on offense, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, offensive line. Then we'll go to defense, D-line, edge, linebacker, and secondary last. So starting with quarterback, Trey Owens. Early enrollee, Cy Fair High School, uh, two tremendous years as a starter, two-year varsity starter. Uh, CJ, he comes into a really a great position for a freshman quarterback with Malik Murphy transferring to Duke and Charles Wright transferring to Appalachian State. Trellins is the number three guy, which means you're only two plays away, by the way. But he's the number three guy, more importantly, for this spring. He gets valuable reps. He's not going to be sharing a lot of reps. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. I mean, and it's, he's going to be throwing to very talented wide receivers as well. It's not going to be, you know, guys very low on the depth chart, especially with this wide receiving class coming in as well. There's going to be a lot of uh, rapport built in this first spring ball for him in this freshman class. Uh, Like you said, Third string is significantly different than what you would see with a fourth or even a fifth string with this Texas quarterback room. That's kind of in that conversation for being one of the most talented uh, quarterback rooms in the entire country. Trey Owens gets the luxury of sitting back, learning the system, learning the playbook, learning the checks, and also watching two very talented quarterbacks ahead of him to get an idea when it comes to the mental reps and, 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 kind of that extra tutelage that you get on the sideline with AJ Milwee and Sarkeesian. So, I love it for Trey Owens because, again, this is a guy that comes off winning the MVP of the Houston Touchdown Club as a senior, uh, beats Katie in the the 6A state playoffs as well, really coming off a tremendous senior season in which we saw a lot of growth from his junior year, coming in as an early enrollee and and as a true freshman. Again, that developmental system gets that extra time that we've seen be so successful for quarterbacks uh, in college football who – Took a year or two to get on the field. This is a very important spring for him, and he gets the luxury of having no pressure, really, to step in and have you know the the, the reins on him right away. And why is it a gr- another thing to factor in here is why is it a great situation for him? Because if Charles Wright had not transferred and he was still there, Trey Owens gets less reps this spring and next season. What Absolutely. does that do? Getting more reps, it prepares him better to hold off a KJ Lacey or somebody coming in that's going to compete with him. So he's going to get more reps this spring than he anticipated when he signed with Texas or committed to Texas. So that's very good when you also look long-term. Okay, there's guys coming in behind me. We know they're going to be talented, but I'm getting more reps this spring and throughout the season, even if it's a scout team, to help put me in the best position to compete against 
uh, the guys coming in. So uh, that's just another little caveat there to the uh, Trey Owens and how good of a situation he's in, ideal, ideal of a situation he's in. All right, running back, two early enrollees. Now we're going to talk about Jarrett Gibson first because he's been committed to Texas a long time out of IMG Academy, physically comes in ready to play from day one at a power five level of 5'10", 210, 215 pounds, whenever you weigh him. Uh, compact, powerful frame. Uh, CJ, a guy that it wouldn't surprise any of us coming from the IMG program. If you're a leader at IMG of the program, him or Jordan Johnson or Bell, it does not surprise you if they get off to a fast start at a spring yeah. practice as an early enrollee. They've been prepped for this for two years. So we wouldn't be surprised if we heard good things about Jarrett Gibson the first couple of weeks of spring practice. No, absolutely not. You nailed it with the IMG uh, leadership qualities as well. I mean, that's a program where you are going up against D1 pro, uh, athletes your entire time in yeah. IMG. Coming into a college pro program like Texas, I mean, you've been, like you said, you've been practicing for this exact moment. Jarrett Gibson's really interesting to me because, like you said, he's only about 5'10" and 5'11 in that range, but he's going to be playing at 215 with pads on. He yeah. is going to have that build that you can look at and say, yeah, he's going to run through folks, but he's kind of got some some quiet shiftiness to his game as well. So this is a very stacked, very talented Texas running back room. Figuring out what kind of role he can kind of carve out early on is going to be very key for him because, like you said, coming in with Christian Clark as well, it, it kind of muddies the water when it comes to getting on the field early. But I tell you what, someone's going to be very happy about this. It's going to be Trey Owens with that third team offense because yeah. that's just more firepower and weapons that he can sit back in his in, in his backfield and create plays with when it comes to scrimmages and the live game situation April 20th. So a uh, really talented prospect. I'm, I'm, I, I love what I see from Jarrett Gibson on film, and it doesn't surprise me at all because, uh, again, what you what we were talking about, this winter conditioning, he's been a standout. He's been a guy that came in with his feet ready to roll. And, uh, it, again, once the pad, pads come on, it's going to be a, a really interesting time to see what he can bring to the field right away. And, and the, key, the key for him, uh, for me, for Jared Gibson as a player moving on uh, as he ascends, is he going to be Blake Corum? That's kind of the question, I think. He, similar frames, Blake Corum maybe in a little bit shorter. Similar frames. Blake Corm's lateral foot quickness was pretty elite high-end stuff. Once he got to the Power 5 game, it really translated. If Jarrett Gibson shows some of that stuff, he's going to end up being a really good player. And now we move on to Christian Clark. Now, both these guys are going to have to exercise some patience because you have C.J. Yeah. Baxter, Jaden Ballou, Trey Wisner, and a tank of Savion Red, right? So you have four experienced guys in front of you. You knew what you were signing up for, but you still have to – have a little patience here because you're going to be five and six when drills start with Coach Choice uh, tomorrow. Christian Clark, this is one where you tip the hat if you have it on. It is difficult to be an early enrollee in the state of Arizona in public schools. So he went through multiple hoops to get that done, to get to Austin in January. That says a lot for his focus, his drive, and kind of where his goals are. Because it's not a lot of guys from Arizona do that. They don't are not early high school graduates. So, first of all, that you give him credit. And you say, okay, this guy's he may be built a little different upstairs. Um, he, he may have a little different aspirations, goals, and uh, the way he sees how his future playing out. But on the field, I think he, I think early on, CJ, we're going to hear he's the most violent cutter of all the running backs. Uh, that he may be the best make you miss between the tackles guy that yep. Texas has, how will that translate to the field? Long way to go, okay? But uh, Christian Clark comes in with tremendous feet and running back frame. Yeah, I, I think the number one thing with Christian Clark that stands out to me was Sarkeesian in the National Signing Day press conference said, you know, we watched the tape and we immediately wrote down Bijan 2.0. And I know you can kind of make that lazy comparison with Arizona coming to right. Texas, but then you watch the tape and you see the one cut ability and the, the, uh, the ability to run through any type of arm tackles. And you say, yeah, there might be something there. Christian Clark, to me, uh, what LaShawn well, McCoy made so popular was that one cut and go. That's a little bit of what you see with the acceleration out of cuts, you know, with Christian Clark came again, like you said, the feet and the lateral quickness, he's got it. 
uh, what he does that balances Jarrett Gibson so well is also in the passing game. And yeah, I think what you yeah. see a little bit, tremendous hands. And that's been a constant focal point of Tashard Choice in this Texas recruiting staff. Jaden Blue, great hands. Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan Brooks, big-time playmaker out of the backfield as well. It's been a constant theme for Texas, and Christian Clark carries that, that torch a little bit further on uh, with this next era of running backs as well. Uh, now we're going to move up to wide receivers. Um, four wide receivers in the class, all four in Austin. Ryan Wingo, Aaron Butler, the last signee of the class from Calabasas, uh, Parker Livingstone, and Freddie DeBose. Uh, so, well, Freddie DeBose, we we want to see if he's 100% healthy, right? That's going to be yeah. first thing. Parker Livingstone obviously missed all but a game, game and a half of his senior year with uh, with a broken foot that required surgery, right? So those two guys. Maybe on a different process, they're on maybe their timelines a little longer. They uh, development wise, patience wise. Uh, but Ryan Wingo, look, he's one of the first guys we heard about when this freshman class came to campus. And then Aaron Butler's been one of the guys you've heard a lot about. With okay, this guy is doing very well. He he is his his, his testing, his speed, his ability to cut. Um, all of those things that you see on tape are kind of translating in workouts already. So four guys coming in, CJ. Obviously, Ryan Wingo's the headliner. Aaron Butler. All the other guys are going to have to exercise some patience, though, because there's a, there's a the three guys coming in from the portal, two here for spring practice. Jonte Cook's back. DeAndre Moore's back. Ryan Niblett's had a year. There's a lot of guys ahead of them as they start their careers at Texas. So patience is the key. Probably outside Wingo. Yeah, patience, I, I think, is something that had to be added to this group a little bit yeah. whenever they signed with Texas. Because, again, the portal just added three new faces, one of which arriving in the summer that these guys probably didn't expect to be on campus by the time that they signed. But, hey, part of the game, part of the new world of college football. Ryan Wingo, I'll start with him because, again, that's the five-star guy. He is the guy coming in with the most expectations, the most hype around his name. And for good reason. The biggest question for me was how much would he be able to, uh, uh, I guess, separate from defensive backs when the talent was similar to what he possessed. Yeah. That's going to maintain my big question mark. But if it's anything like we saw in San Antonio for the All-American Bowl, he's going to have no issues. He's going to be able to use his frame and acceleration to create separation and create big plays. That's what he did down in San Antonio against the top DBs in the country. And I expect that to be a similar case to what we hear early on in spring football for him. Aaron Butler is going to be interesting because, again, Jerry, not a lot of intel on what he is as a player. We've seen the tape, but it, because he came in so late, we don't have all the big stories. Season. He set out half his senior year, so he wasn't yep. seen a lot, to your point. Yeah, the, There wasn't a, a whole lot of intel on what he was as a football player, aside from just the, the tape. Yeah. Getting to campus early and those re reports that we've heard about from, from Bobby Burton specifically on On Texas Football – I mean, it sounds to me like he's hitting the ground extremely fast and he's ready for what college football is. That's exciting to me, again, because you can walk in and compete with the DeAndre Moore, push John Tate Cook, maybe carve out a role of your own with Isaiah Bond being uh, and, and Matthew Golden being the only two portal additions. That uh, kind of lends a little bit of a, a opportunity for Aaron Butler. And again, with Parker Livingstone and Freddie DeBose coming off of injury, what does that mean for them? I know Parker uh, specifically has high hopes for what his time in, in, in Austin means for him. And uh, again, kind of the, the goals and aspirations he has for being a Texas Longhorn. It's going to be interesting, again, to see how quickly they get off because that patience is going to test guys, especially at the wide receiver spot where all these guys are used to being fed the ball so often in their high school careers. And the number one thing for all these guys, no matter if you're Ryan Wingo, Butler, Parker Livingstone, or Freddie DeBose, how quickly do you pick up a complex system for a wide receiver? That's yep. a massive change from high school to college in Steve Sarkeesian's uh, scheme and what is asked of the wide receivers pre-snap. It took John Tay Cook a lot of time. It takes guys time. The, if Ryan Wingo, if he passes that test pretty quick, I, you may end up having a pretty uh, first-round pick one day. Uh, Aaron Butler, the one thing I want to add on him, his father played in the NFL, so he's been around it. He was he's such a talented player. You know how talented Aaron Butler is? He was committed to USC after his sophomore year as a corner. He flipped and committed to Deion Sanders, who has – for those that – like don't like Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders knows what a player looks like. Okay, he, he knows talent. He knows talent. 
So he committed to Colorado, and then he ends up at Texas with Sarkeesian. So USC, Lincoln Riley, Deion Sanders, Steve Sarkeesian. Not a bad place to start your college career from a talent standpoint. All right, tied in, CJ. Jordan Washington, I think one of the guys that excites us most, yep. and that's the way recruiting is, because we say, okay, he's a four-star. He's got a chance to be play above all the rankings, various rankings nationally. Oh, and he was a basketball trans guy transitioning to football. Oh, and he was about 218 pounds and he committed to Texas. Now he's listed at 240. Yeah. So he's not a hard guy to say arrow up ascending quicker than some other guys. And then you watch his tape and you're like, okay, Todd Thompson at Langham Creek asked him to play different roles at that tight end position. He wasn't a Jatavion Sanders split wide guy in high school, right? He did, but he also was a sniffer of sorts. He also lined up in a three-point stance. Todd Thompson does a really good job at Langham Creek, and he prepared that kid, and it showed on tape he's more than a willing blocker as a young yes. player. He's a guy that has a lot of intrigue for me. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the willing blocking for Jordan Washington. You don't see that a lot when these converted basketball kids come in yeah. and play tight end. You know, last that's one of those, yeah, yeah, you normally see that as one of the last tools in their bag when it comes to being a complete tight end. The willingness jumps off the page for me when you watch his high school tape. And now at 240 pounds, you can expect that to kind of be, you know, something he leans on a little bit more because it takes time at the, the college level, especially for new tight ends to really get acclimated to the trench life. You know, it took Jatavian Sanders a full season before the, the Jeff Banks and the Texas staff was like, all right, now we trust you to go out there and be the tight end that we know you could be. Jordan Washington kind of being behind these guys is going to work a benefit for him because he's not going to have that expectation and that pressure to get on the field right away. I, I love his, his whole makeup as a tight end. He can go up, he can make the big play down the field, he can play in line, and he can, again, willingly block. That's half the battle as a tight end. Just getting in the way is a win most of the time. I'm really excited to see what those reports are for him as an as a early enrollee in his first spring. And he doesn't lack for confidence. Those or those that don't know or new to on Texas football, and there's a lot of thousands of you. We had him on a couple of times after he committed to Texas, and he, he's an impressive interview. Uh, well spoken, intelligent kid. All right, offensive line. Three offensive line signees, two guys that are early enrollees, Brandon Baker, right tackle, a modern day, borderline four star, five star guy. Um, probably those that move them down the four star may end up regretting it based on what we're hearing early on. And then Daniel Cruz, who's always been underrated. I'll keep saying it until i am proven correct. Uh, no matter if you had him ranked 150, 200, or 300 in the country, Daniel Cruz is going to outplay his ranking. Uh, he's one of those guys. So Texas has two early enrollees. Daniel Cruz is a rarity for me, CJ, because there's not many guys that I've said physically walked in the Power 5 football ready to compete day one on the offensive line. Correct. There's guys that end up starting or playing a lot, but there's very few guys as an early enrollee. I've said that guy physically can go take on Savea and hold his own. He's not going to be overwhelmed physically. Um, then you have Brandon Baker, who played right tackle at modern day. Will tra he'll train at both spots. Cam Williams is trained at both spots at Texas. Flood's going to prepare him and train him to play both. But if you say, okay, he he might be your future starting right tackle, uh, there, there's not going to be bet, many better in the 24 class when we look back on it. I mean, you've taught, you've heard some of the reviews he's gotten early on, but that's two tremendous offensive line prospects to add to what's great depth this spring on the offensive line. Yeah, absolutely. No longer are you looking at just one early enrollee that's thrown into the starting lineup before the season even begins. That's kind of how far this Texas offensive line room has changed. And again, adding these pieces to what isn't going to be, uh, you know, kind of a hellfire situation, it, it's going to work wonders for them and everybody else that's not expected to be, you know, a difference maker from the minute they step on the field. Uh, I want to start with Daniel Cruz because, again, coming in at 307 pounds, Jerry, that's right on par with what you see from the average starting line, uh, center in the SEC. Yeah. Uh, and the mental makeup for Daniel Cruz is is massive. He is a guy that gets it. Ask him to play center his senior season at Richland. I mean, huge. He gets the idea of what it's like to sit down, evaluate what's going on with the defense, 
communicate with his offensive line and then snap the football and play after that. That's not an easy thing to do, especially at the next level. Having that under his belt is huge. Uh, But with Brandon Baker specifically, the five-star rating with his name that comes in, at that right tackle spot, it's going to continue that tackles, you know, that capstone on each side that Texas has had great success with recently. And I I was talking about it earlier this, this winter. You start looking ahead to future seasons on that Texas offensive line. Right now, you got a first rounder at Kelvin Banks on left tackle. You got a 6'5, 360 pounder with Cam Williams with a lot of expectations. The further you go down the list, you're going to replace him with a five star in Brandon Baker. And now you're looking at a 6'8, 315 pound guy that can move very well in Trevor Goosby at left tackle. The future is very bright. Yeah. And getting Brandon Baker on campus early is only going to continue that process of development at the tackle spots. And Texas fans, raise your hand. The last time Texas had four players at the center position, you said, wow, those guys are all pretty good, really good players. Yeah. Nobody's raising their hand. That hadn't happened. All right, moving on to D-line. Um, Alex January, that's it. Okay, we got to talk about like Alex January, uh, Melvin Hills, a June uh, enrollee, DeAndre Robinson, obviously after Bo Davis left, uh, flipped to Florida. Um, Alex January, a guy we've heard very positive things about this spring, and it shouldn't headed into spring practice and it shouldn't surprise us because he was the defensive player of the year in that high school district with yep. Colin Simmons, the Abrams kid at edge rusher at the Soto, all those defensive backs, all those linemen, all those edge guys in that district, Elijah Barnes in that district. I mean, you think about how many power five defensive players were in that district last year. And then Alex January was named the defensive player of the year by the coaches in that district. That should have been a warning sign for Texas fans. Forget about his national ranking. Probably everybody's going to end up missing on it if he stays healthy. But Alex January, because he had his dad played at Texas, understood hand placement. He comes in a little ahead technically. And now that he gave up baseball and had that last spring practice before his senior year, he's turned into a different guy as a player. And so now what you're seeing is a guy that Texas fans have high hopes for being a rotational piece over the ball, which is maybe the biggest question mark for Texas heading into the spring, CJ. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, you know, what's interesting is we talk about all these guys getting to campus and gaining weight and seeing what the the transformation in the weight room has done to them so far. He slimmed down about 10 pounds, down about 315. But I think that's great. Great for him. Now he can build back up over the summer months with some good muscle and and really fill out that frame to what we expect him to be right in that 325 to 330 range by the time he really gets on the field for the Longhorns. But like you said, Jerry, he's going to be in a position where he's going to have to continue that quick progression to the field. We're going to have to see him on the field a little because right now that's probably the biggest question mark on the Texas team is who's going to be that guy over the center. If he comes in and impresses a whole lot like – we kind of behind the scenes think he might. There's a good chance that we see him early and often in the 2024 fall season. And that's great stuff because, like you said, he was an MVP of his district. And that yeah. includes the five-star guy that was three yeah. feet outside of him. Yeah. And so uh, really, really interesting stuff. And I think what you're going to see is his hands and, like you said, the ability to shed blockers technically more so off of raw strength and, and, and kind of out-athleting people is going to translate to the next level. That's always kind of the big concern when you get these highly talented uh, interior defensive linemen is was your high school success more so just, uh, uh, I guess, the result of you just being bigger, faster, stronger than who you're going against. I don't think that was the case. Yeah, you can can just bull rush a lot of guys at the high school. Absolutely. Um, And and by the way, Alex is coming in in a great place because – he is the coming into where the new position coaches, the position coach change on the Texas staff. The last year it was wide receiver, which is great for all those receivers coming in. And, and you're coming in with a clean slate, new coach. So you, th- we know how this goes. Who is Kenny Baker going to trust? Who are going to end up being his guys? Who takes his coaching, his film room, and communicates with him, earns his trust? That to this day, not one thing hasn't changed. That's what gets you on the field. Um, these guys are going to play the ones they trust on a very talented roster. So Alex has a great opportunity because he's not coming in where Bo Davis is back and has these built-in long-standing relationships 
with Alex, uh, um, so Alfred Collins. Great point. Broughton, Aaron Bryant, all these guys. Clean slate. They all mm-hmm. start in the same place tomorrow. Good opportunity for a freshman. All right, Edge. I mean, Colin Simmons, obviously, is the, the, the one um, we're talking about. He has a chance to be, um, if he if he puts it together, um, you know, Kelvin Banks, Anthony Hill, that next guy that's being talked about is the freshman that comes in and makes a difference on a program that's really good. Kelvin helped start to turn the tide at Texas. Anthony Hill was a big flip from a and at a position where Texas needed it. Colin Simmons on defense may be as important as important a recruit as Texas has had under Sark because it's the first five-star edge prospect. He was at Duncanville. He was going to play in the SEC. If you didn't get him, he was going to LSU. Right. And that would have been created some issues recruiting Duncanville High School. I'm just here to tell you. They're already fighting it with LSU right now with DeCorey Moore. But Colin Simmons, possibility to be that next kind of game-changing talent and Texas has to have great edge rush in the SEC because the offensive line talent is going up about seven notches here in a few months. Yeah, and he's absolutely transformed his body from what we even saw in Orlando, Jerry, for the Under Armour All-American game, a game in which he didn't participate in because of his ankle, sprained ankle that he suffered uh, midway through his senior season, played that, it out. Not, one to, not to cut you off, but that was legitimate why he didn't play. We were down there um, – that the trainer at the Under Armour game held him out. So I want that to be clear to Texas fans. That was not Colin Simmons saying I'm, I'm Cadillac and I don't want to play. That he had a legitimate high ankle sprain. That the Under Armour trainer said, "No, this guy does not need to play this week." So all right, go ahead, CJ. I just want to make sure Texas fans knew the the, the true deal on that. Yeah, well, to go from being sidelined to adding about fifteen to twenty pounds into winter conditioning that quickly goes to show you the work ethic goes to show you his dedication to the nutritional side of things as well, because that was a big factor in seeing his body change this quickly up to about 235, 240 pounds, right in that range. That's where you want him to be entering spring, leaving spring. You'd like to see him add another 10 pounds, keep that weight up uh, because that quickness, that twitch, that explosion is not going to disappear anytime soon with Colin Simmons, and that's, again, that's kind of the intrigue with him because he's not the tallest guy off the edge. What he is going to beat you with is speed and quickness, uh, going under blocks, you know, spin moves, whatever it might be, whatever's in his bag, which is expanding by the day. I was able to talk to him in Orlando, and I asked him, I was like, what's going to be the biggest thing that you focus on this winter? He goes, I've got to start adding pieces to my to my pass rushing bag. And he got to sit there and talk with the, the third and Longhorn fellas as well. That was a big conversation point with Alex Okafor and, uh, you know, some of those guys, uh, Rod B and that group as well. When it comes to fine-tuning early playtime on the field, it's all about technicalities and and what you have in your bag. Colin Simmons is focused on that right now, and you're going to – again, he's going to be the guy that you hear probably the most about when it comes to early impact for this Texas team. And then there's Zeno Meozulo. Uh, So Zena up about 20 pounds. Yeah. At least, I mean, from Under Armour week, shouldn't that's not a surprise because the long frame, um, once you get in that college strength and conditioning program, those guys can tend to put on 20 pretty quick. Nutritional program at the college level, strength and conditioning program at the college level, and being not that Nathan Daughtry, those guys do a great job training him and Phil Sami and Riley Pettijon, but it's a different push on a day-to-day basis. Those guys prepare them for what happens in college when you're sitting there and you see Ethan Burke in the rep before you and you see Baron Sorrell and you're next to Colin Simmons. Those guys tend to put on weight pretty quickly. They have those long frames because they they get taken to another level, whether it's nutrition or offseason, that they haven't before. Yeah, absolutely. And to put it in perspective, he came in at 6'5", 255. Yeah. Baron Sorrell, 259, Ethan Burke at 6'7", right around the low 260. So he's physically there off yeah. the edge spot with the length, with the height. He can play uh, that that edge spot for the Longhorns immediately if needed to. He's a body that can fit in. Will there be a necessity? Probably not, but it does give Texas that luxury of extra development and time to 
get him right and to be a plus by the time he gets on the field. I'm excited to see what Zena can do. Because like we said, we know he, he has an understanding of what the college system's like. Obviously, with NATO, his brother, having gone through a couple of these now. Uh, but hey, with with Zena, if he can keep that, you know, that kind of switch flipped on, he's going to be a, a big time ball player for the Longhorns. And again, patience, the key for these guys, right? I mean, patience, the key. If, if, if Ethan Burke dabbles in playing the same side Baron Sorrell does, that means Justice Finkley. Or that means all three of those guys are, are ahead of you. Yeah. So patience is the key. And bet on the process. Bet on your process long term if you're Zena. Uh, because Baron Sorrell, final year playing. Ethan Burke could be off to the NFL with a great year this year. We don't know. Um, so that it's all about process for all these guys, but especially these upside guys like Zena. All right, before we get to uh, linebacker Tyanthe Smith and DBs to close this out, I want to take a second again for uh, the sole sponsor of Talking Ball. That's John Donovan, president of Longhorn Wealth Management Group. John is a proud Texas X's life member, and his wife and all six of his siblings are also proud University of Texas graduates. John has also served over 15 years as a Texas X's board member and as a certified financial planner who has spent over 30 years providing investment, retirement, insurance, and estate planning services and solutions to all his clients. So it is John, It is John's long history with and love of UT that explains why he has dedicated his firm to providing total wealth management for Texas alumni, employee, family, and friends. Longhorn Wealth wants to wish the best of luck to the men's and women's basketball teams as they prepare to enter their respective NCAA tournament this, this week. And we hope both advance as far as possible in their respective brackets. Speaking of adv advancing, Longhorn Wealth wants to offer a free 90-minute consultation to all the On Texas football family and friends to help them advise their own financial future success. So please call John Donovan and his team at Longhorn Wealth at 972-707-4900 or visit longhornwealth.net for your free 90-minute consultation to explore how Longhorn Wealth management group can help you achieve true financial independence. All right, CJ, two, two positions left. Uh, I've got Ty Anthony Smith, the only linebacker in the class, um, flipped from Texas A&M. Texas was only going to take one backer in that class. It was going to be a Ty Anthony Smith flip or Justin Williams flip, which was never really in play, despite what people thought. So Ty Anthony Smith, patience is big here. We're talking about a multi-sport, small school athlete from Jasper, Texas. Those guys, 10, especially a guy that's going to play linebacker, they need some time to bake yep. a little bit. They need the process to be very process-oriented. So I don't expect we hear a ton about Ty Anthony Smith this spring necessarily, other than athletic, long arms, uh, a heady guy, learns quickly. He's an intelligent guy. I think the, the physical part needs a little time with him. But here's where it gets interesting in spring football. If we start to hear a little bit more than you expect about Ty Anthony Smith, you say, ooh, a year from now, Texas probably has something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's still south of 200 pounds, which in the SEC, probably not what you want, you know, a middle linebacker to look like. But like you said, he's a sponge. I mean, this is a guy that takes in new in intel and, and, and processes it very quickly. He's very good at understanding concepts looking at schemes and, and coverages and, and being like, yeah, I know where I need to be on the field. That's something that I think will play to his success early on. And like you said, if that kind of becomes the trend here down the road, you can look at it and say, all right, yeah, Texas has got a, got a big time ball player with Ty Anthony Smith. And for him to be the only linebacker in this class, there's going to be a little bit of an extra focus on him to get him up to speed. And yeah. a lot of guys in that room to help him lean on when it comes to getting up to speed and getting kind of the ropes down of a spring football at Texas. But I'm excited for it because again, He's a guy that, Jerry, you, we've seen in person a number of times. And watching him kind of man the field uh, as a safety in seven-on-seven seven to me was one of those things where I was like, it doesn't matter where he is on the field, he's going to make plays. Yeah, a couple things too. So he's similar to some guys Johnny Nansen has recruited in the past. Yeah. But you see, Johnny Nansen wasn't at the Blue Blood program where he brought in 6'1", 225, Anthony Hill-looking guys. This is a prospect that kind of fits what Nansen has developed and something to keep in mind there, the new co-DC linebackers coach at Texas, Johnny Nansen. Uh, last, and also I want to add one other thing on Ty Anthony Smith that speaks to what you said. He played running back, 
wide receiver, oh, yeah. linebacker, safety, played him off the edge. Uh, when I was at Jasper talking to the staff, they they mentioned the the head coach head coach Cremody mentioned that he's smart enough to where you can move him around and ask him to do different things and it doesn't overwhelm him. That's right. always Quandre Diggles was that way. We've talked about other prospects that played all over the place at, for for their high school, uh, and then those the guys are all the same. They have the ability to process things that that is a good thing for ty anthony smith for texas fans to remember all right defensive backs a lot of talent in the early enrollee let's just Lots go through xavier fills to me at safety obviously right you have wardell mack at corner you have jordan johnson rubel um at safety um and then you know that there's a there's a lot of talent that's early enrollees at the d and kobe black at corner right so i mean there you have four guys as early enrollees, and there is opportunity, whether it's a second team safety, whether it's competing at a backup corner spot. Um, let's let's go, let's talk about the safeties first. Xavier Filsamy was one of the first guys, along with Ryan Wingo, that was really you heard was really impressing the Texas staff of the early enrollees. And he physically came in looking like a power five football player. You saw him in Orlando, CJ. He didn't look like the guy that you're like, oh, he needs some time physically. You're, you're like, ooh, if he actually picks all this stuff up, he is physically ready to roll. And then Jordan John Turbell, who's a kind of a nickel safety. He People are always going to say the same thing about him. There's bigger guys. Oh, there may be some faster guys. But you know what? He was the pretty much the captain of the IMG program. Something just to kind of – put in the memory bank for Texas fans if that guy goes on and has a really good career. Those guys that are captains at IMG are generally really good college football players. So <laughs> two quality safeties. The question with Jordan Johnson Bell is where he's going to play. Is it nickel? Is it safety? And I think it's to be determined. You know, I'll start with Jordan Johnson Rubel because we both got to talk to him in Orlando. And I think for me, the first time getting to talk to him a little bit is the kid is very smart. He's yes. very cerebral, and when you get to talking X's and O's with them, it jumps off the page with them, just how much he knows about the game of football, which means, to me, playing close to the line of scrimmage and that Jade Barron role that we've seen so much of his impact come because of his brain, it makes sense. But then you watch the tape and you say, oh, yeah, this kid can also run sideline to sideline a little bit. He's got that track speed from his sophomore year in which – has carried over to now that says, yeah, even at 5'10", 5'11", he's going to be able to play at 195 pounds, 200 pounds, and be able to play. And he's going to do so because of his brain and the way that he diagnoses uh, plays immediately. I, I I loved what I saw from Jordan Johnson Rubel on my first time watching him. Uh, and then, you know, his counterpart in this class, Xavier Phils to me, nothing but great things so far out of winter conditioning. He's probably, like you said, one of those top two or three guys that we've heard the most about since camp started up. And hey, for a good reason. There's an open spot in that secondary. Battling out with Jelani McDonald and that new group of, of safeties is going to be huge. Uh, uh, Xavier Filson, he checks every box that you want to have as a safety. He's a prototypical, prototypical size, height, weight, can run like the wind as well. You get him in that physical defense in McKinney as well. There's no question marks as to how much he wants to play the game and hit. Now it translates to the college game and what kind of impact he can have early on. We're going to be hearing about him pretty often. I think the corners are very interesting. And Wardell Matt could be a nickel corner, but he'll start his career corner, right? Both of them, I think, are pretty raw. Uh, Wardell Mack played safety, played corner, played a receiver, kind of played all over the place, right? So he's literally going to be concentrating on a singular position for the first time. Kobe Black, somewhat similar to that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you play corner, but teams don't really challenge you at a smaller school at corner. So then you you know you play wide receiver, you play safety, you kind of play all over the place. You play multiple sports. Same thing. Now he comes from a power five family. His father played at K State, and his brother's a really good corner uh, at Oklahoma State, right? So he comes from that, but still he's now really locking in and concentrating on corner for the first time solely. Uh, so I think these guys have a little bit longer of a runway in front of them than maybe the Phil Simi and Jordan Johnson or Bell have, but they're they're certainly not void of talent. The big question for me, CJ, is you saw Kobe Black in Orlando just like I did. That was 6'2", 200 pounds, and he wasn't really defined. No, not at all. Not so at all. Said, is he going to be 215, or is Texas going to be able to keep him where Ryan Watts was? 
I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with Kobe Black physically and then how quickly Wardell Mack picks up uh, the corner position. Yeah, I think with Kobe Black, he's a guy that because of his height, because of his length and what his body will eventually turn into, he's probably primed to be your boundary corner of the future in my eyes. I think because of that physicality that he also kind of possesses in that game, that length will allow you to say, all right, this this third of the field is yours. No one else is coming in here. You're going to be on an island. Go make plays. And he's going to be able to do so because he is very raw, but at the same time, we saw him make plays against the highest competition that he faced this year rather often. And it yeah. did so without really any type of tuning to his body. He doesn't necessarily look like a guy that, and I say this in a complimentary fashion, he doesn't look like a guy that was a borderline five-star. He plays that way. He plays above what he looks like. But now that you can get him in that weight room over an extended period of time, you're going to see tremendous transformation to his body. And that's only going to help him on the field. Uh Again, the Texas DB room is going to be very exciting. Mac is a, another guy to me that you look at and you say, all right, what's kind of the strength of your game? Right now it's coming downhill. It's a guy that where you can use your strength to close uh, your, that, that length to close uh, distances very quickly when the ball is coming out your way. In breaking routes, slants, uh, digs, anything like that, he's going to be on the back of a receiver fighting through to make the play. That's something that you saw very often in this film. And I'm excited to see again, what he can do in space. I think he's a field corner through and through and Texas has a very good pairing there until a guy like uh, uh, Santana Wilson comes in this summer as well to kind of stir up the, the pot a little bit. All right, guys, that is uh we're trying to get you ready for spring ball less than 24 hours away. That is a look at the 17 early enrollees at the University of Texas, who will be hitting the practice field for the first time officially as Texas Longhorns. Yet, yeah, Tory Back does a great job. Yet, yeah, they've been, yeah, they've been in the film room a little bit, but this is where it gets real for these guys. This is where you see, okay, did the same guys that impressed us in all these workouts, how quickly is that happening on the field? And if you get guys that suddenly transition in both, you end up with Anthony Hills of the world. So we'll see where this Texas freshman class goes. Wasn't that long ago that Arch Manning got off the bus and sprinted in to the practice field. Uh, so it, it's going to be fun tomorrow. Bobby Burton, uh, myself, CJ Vogel will all be uh, on hand for that media uh, window and we'll have shows afterwards talking about it. We'll have coffee and football live uh, from UT tomorrow morning. So uh, for CJ Vogel, I'm Jerry Hamilton. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a great time to be a Texas fan. Spring football's here.